So this one I'm not too familiar with. Y'all ever heard of a story about some teens, something happened to some teens in upstate New York caused a lot of uh, illnesses, body malfunctions and different things like that? Did y'all ever call that story? I don't remember hearing about this one, so I'm definitely, definitely want to check this one out. Every town has a dark side. Over 300 years ago, in the English colony of Salem, now Massachusetts, the entire community was gripped with terror and uncertainty when two girls, ages 9 and 11, daughters of the local minister, began acting strangely. What started as a peculiar illness characterized by convulsions, fevers, and hallucinations affecting only the two girls quickly escalated into a maelstorm of terror and paranoia that gripped the entire town and remains difficult to explain to this very day. The Salem Witch Trials were one of the darkest episodes in American history, events that in one way, shape, or form were caused by what we now know as mass hysteria. Events that, because of the human psyche, are doomed to repeat themselves over and over again. In a small town in upstate New York in late 2011, they did. It happened when a teenager woke up from a nap suffering from terrifying symptoms, and soon she wasn't the only one, sending the entire town of Leroy into complete chaos. Hey guys, it's Andrew, and thanks for tuning in to another episode of Every Town, where today we're checking out a very creepy case that grew out of a perfect storm of circumstances. Were the townsfolk justified in their panic when their children fell ill? Or was this a case of mass hysteria in the modern era? Let's find out together and dig into all the strange events happening in Leroy, New York. In mid-2011, the small town of Leroy in upstate New York appeared to be just another normal, safe, and peaceful place with really nothing all that spectacular to set it apart from any other town in the U.S. The population of just 7,500 was a typical rural community that prided itself on doing things right, as their slogan says. A place where people could raise their children away from the stressful pace of city life It was also a town with a bit of an interesting history. For a long time, companies like Jell-O employed thousands of people here, roughly from 1897 up until the 1960s when they moved their factories. This left Leroy as a relatively stable manufacturing community after that, although its heyday was certainly behind it because Jell-O is tough to top. And so by 2011, really, its main attraction was its excellent schools, which drew people from the nearby city of Rochester. But then all the strangeness began. And this all can be traced back to Katie Crotswurst, cheerleader at Leroy High School who awoke from a nap one day to find that she had transformed into a different person. And that's really the best way to describe what happened. Katie was an athletic and poised young woman, as evident by her prominent position on the school's cheerleading squad. Discipline that, as you know, requires coordination, good reflexes, and agility. However, as soon as she woke up on this day, Katie knew something was terribly wrong. Her chin was swinging back and forth uncontrollably, and her face started to contort into violent and involuntary spasms. And Katie was at her boyfriend's house when these symptoms began, and so they drove down to the emergency room thinking it might be some sort of stroke, but luckily the doctor suggested that it was probably an anxiety attack. You know what? I was thinking that earlier when they were talking about mass hysteria, people waking up, feeling in some type of way. I was thinking, because I, I know this day and time, anxiety is talked about frequently, but how... How much was anxiety talked about or even diagnosed back then? I also thought of possession. When you say somebody wakes up as a different person, I start thinking, okay, are they possessed? Is it that? 
jaw moving uncontrollably different by you can't control I, 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 I don't know nothing too serious to be concerned about they thought and Katie herself figured that made sense and she admitted that from time to time she did get anxious about her schoolwork and the general pressures of teenage life and they sent her home with some mild medications assuring her that things would get better when her mom brought her back to the doctor just days later with no relief in sight, concerns began to grow. Wait a minute. Did they not say she woke up at her boyfriend's house? She a teenager, right? Y'all letting y'all kid fall asleep or wake? Not saying he did anything. I'm just saying. I'm just trying to rule out all possibilities at this point. Just, just thought I, anybody else caught that. At first, Katie's case seemed like an isolated incident, a random illness that despite having no proven explanation beyond the stress of being a teenager, didn't worry anyone too much as it didn't appear life-threatening. After a few weeks, however, things began to escalate in the town of Leroy. While Katie was still dealing with her own issues, her best friend, Vera Sanchez, who was the captain of the school's cheerleading squad, woke up from a nap one day with similar symptoms as Katie. At first, she began to stutter. Then she started to shake uncontrollably, flailing her arms and shaking her head side to side in an unnatural manner. When doctors told Thera's mother, Melissa, that her daughter's tics were the result of stress, she was skeptical since she knew what Katie was dealing with. But at the same time, what else could they do? Again, there was no apparent immediate danger with her health, and so they hoped that it all just subsided within a few days, and time would tell. And then two weeks later, the next case came in. Lydia Parker, a senior who also experienced tics, arms flailing, and mumbling. More or less, the same thing happened to Chelsea Dumars, another cheerleader who had recently moved to town and who... It was rumored had begun making the same strange noises and suffering the same tics, spasms, and motor problems as the previous young women. Same school. All this is happening. One happens. Okay. Maybe she has anxiety. Stuff like that. Two happens. This is it's weird. Three happens. There's no coincidence to me anymore. Some, somebody's doing something to them or, or something, bro. All athletic, cheerleader type. You know what I mean? No, ain't no way. Ain't no way. So what exactly was going on here? The townsfolk were demanding answers. I mean, how many more would it take? The situation then began to spiral out of control as the number of students experiencing the same weird symptoms grew. Another few days and the number was up to six. Then 12 teenagers were affected by the strange affliction. It ballooned up to 15 and then 18 in a school of just 600 students. But it didn't stop there. The strange illness, which at first seemed to have preference, only affecting those who you might call popular kids in school, then began to spread, affecting girls who weren't cheerleaders at all, then a boy, and even a 36-year-old woman. Long before the number of people affected by this mysterious illness reached its peak, well, parents in Leroy, who were worried about the health and well-being of their children, were only left to speculate. Y'all think something with that Jello factory, maybe? I'm trying to think of different things that he kind of alluded to in the beginning. You know, the factory, something maybe they ate, that they all shared in common, that they ate different things that are simpler. I don't know, man. 
Shoot, high school lunch used to freak me out. That's why I only ate on like chicken and pizza day. Was there something in the water at school? Lead pipes, maybe. Was it a chemical in the fertilizer laid out on the playgrounds and fields of the school? Maybe it was mold or a new street drug that someone was manufacturing in some bathtub in town that none of the kids wanted to talk about out of fear of getting in trouble. By mid-January, with about a dozen known cases at that point, the anxious parents of Leroy awaited the preliminary results of the New York State Department of Health investigation of the area. But at the community meeting where the results were to be announced, officials claimed they could not reveal the diagnosis out of respect for patient privacy. And nevertheless, they tried to reassure the crowd that the school environment was safe. Statements that not surprisingly left many parents unsatisfied and even pissed off, including Beth Miller, the mother of Katie, first victim, and her husband and Katie's stepfather, Don Miller. As media caught wind of the strange illness in Leroy, soon young Katie and Thera, accompanied by their mothers, appeared on the nationally televised Today Show. And during the segment, Katie's tick seemed under control for the most part, but Thera's were extreme. She would shake her head to one side and flail her arms all across her body and sometimes stutter a word before letting out a guttural scream. And she stated, I was always very active and everyone loved being around me, but I no longer feel like myself. The girl's media appearance set off a fierce chain of reactions. The numerous local and national news outlets, Facebook profiles, autism blogs and websites dedicated to mental health and environmental issues picking up on the strange situation unfolding in upstate New York. Shortly thereafter, in fact, just the day after the girl's media appearance on the Today Show, a Buffalo neurologist whose practice had seen several of the affected young women at this point was given the go-ahead to discuss the diagnosis in order to try and quiet the panic. And it was a bittersweet diagnosis for parents and patients alike. This wasn't any mold or drugs or chemicals. It was, in fact, what the doctors had initially been saying all along, with a little bit more attached, though. It was conversion disorder, which is described as a physical response to overwhelming stress or emotional distress, and is more common in people going through difficult emotional situations and in those who suffer from anxiety or depression. Oh my gosh, bro. Like, we really need to hone in on what stress, what all stress can do to us, the capabilities of stress. Because if we sit down, a group of people, a group of us together at a table, and we say, what do you think stress does to the body or to the person? What do you think stress does to a person? What do you think? I'd get probably all different answers. And probably all of them would be right. Bro, we need to get a handle on that. Take myself, for example, man. I, I've told y'all, I've had a lot of death happen to me this year alone. And it affects you in a way, man. And that's a form of stress, the way it affects you. Like, so I, you have to constantly get a handle on that. To see that, what that did to those girls... And we all now more than ever talk about anxiety. And that's an early age, bro. Imagine the pressures on some of these teens today, what they got with social media, bro. Ooh. It is also three times more common in women than in men. And although it affects people of all ages, it's more common between the ages of 20 and 50. But because the symptoms had appeared in multiple teenagers so fast, in addition to conversion disorder, the neurologist added another item to his diagnosis, mass psychogenic outbreak, which would more commonly be known as an instance of mass hysteria.
In an unbiased analysis, the diagnosis wasn't too far-fetched as this condition is much more common than one might think. But it still wasn't enough for the teenager's representatives. One of the girl's guardians said, It's very hard to swallow this pill. Are we living in the 16th century? Meanwhile, James DuPont, the father of one of the affected girls, told CNN, A lot of these kids were just living happy, normal lives. Don Miller, the father of the first patient, also joined the ranks of those unhappy with the diagnosis, telling the media, My daughter didn't suffer any trauma. She was just happy and living her life. She was as happy as she could be. Cases like this one are interesting, and really, they highlight the urgent human need to have someone or something tangible to blame when things happen that we simply can't understand. In other words, the parents weren't happy because how does mass hysteria even happen in the first place? It just seems like a lame excuse. But it's most certainly a real thing, and it's happened time and time again all throughout history. Going back to where we started in 1692 in the then English colony of Massachusetts, that similar story unfolded when young Betty Paris, who was nine, and her cousin Abigail, who was 11, both residents of the rural town of Salem, began to exhibit similar symptoms. And the girls, the daughter and niece of Samuel Paris, the community's new minister, began to suffer from high fevers, convulsions, and severe spasms. It was even rumored that they were running around the house on all fours, barking and growling like dogs. And the situation alarmed the community, of course, which could find no logical or medical explanation for the girl's suffering. To make matters worse, the symptoms then began to spread, affecting more and more women in the town, turning confusion into paranoia and that into fear. Unable to find a logical and rational explanation for what was happening, the townspeople came to the conclusion, through rumor after rumor, that it could only be the work of Satan himself, and they needed to protect themselves. The Paris girls had already said they suspected that they had been bewitched by mysterious women whose shadows they had seen lurking around the house. The locals then believed they had finally found the answer in a book called Memorable Providence. In this book, written by the Puritan Reverend Cotton Mather, covered many cases of possessions and it also mentioned an alleged case of witchcraft in Boston, where an Irish woman suffered from the same symptoms as the girls in their town. And the entire city came to the same conclusion. There must be witches among them, hiding, looking to wreak havoc and unleash pain. That right there pretty much sealed their fate. It's over for them. I don't even expect them to live long after that. They're going to do something to them. See, in our day and time, we diagnose, we try to fix it, different things like that. Back then, no. You were a threat. You were feared. You, you, uh, it, they figured it was spread amongst everybody else. So they was going to take you off the map. Yeah, yeah, that sealed their fate. And the collective madness that gripped Salem was so great that in less than three months, some 14 women, five men, and even two dogs were executed for being alleged servants of the devil. Of course, that was the start of what would become the Salem Witch Trials, and it is perhaps the most well-known example of mass hysteria. But... There's been hundreds of examples of this same sort of thing occurring in little pockets of the world forever. The Halifax Slasher in England, back in 1938, is a good example, where in the span of two weeks, more than ten people came forward with claims that a mysterious attacker was coming from the shadows and slashing them at random. The victims were, interestingly, mostly women, 
the town went into a frenzy, but as it turns out, well, none of the attacks ever happened. The June bug incident in 1962 happened at a dressmaking textile factory when the women there started to suffer from numbness, nausea, dizziness, and vomiting. Word got around that a bug was in the building, biting them. And in the end, 62 employees developed symptoms, with some even being hospitalized. But experts in the U.S. Public Health Service looked into it, and there were no bugs, no bite marks on the people. It was concluded that anxiety was the cause, and it just caught on with everyone who worked there. scary because something like that could, could happen right here in your town, my town, your kids, my kids, anybody's kids, you know what I mean? And you just don't know what to do. Your kid goes from just being her, their normal self to someone completely different and it just they can't control it, bro. Like that, that would, bro, that would destroy me. Like, I'd rather it happen to me than my kids. And back in Leroy, well, it was the same sort of situation. The mind is a powerful thing, more powerful than most realize. You ever been in a situation where you faked you were sick, only to actually start feeling ill? That's the mind-body connection working. So when these cheerleaders saw that their friends were sick, well... They thought they were too, and soon the dominoes fell. While the parents in this case didn't blame the devil or a slasher or a bug, they did find someone to point the finger at. In the not-so-distant past, Leroy had been a major industrial center filled with factories of all kinds, so... There were many neighbors when the midst of typical dinner conversation speculated about what kind of waste might have been left behind by Leroy's long-closed industrial plants. The older resident said that in the past, you could always tell what flavor was being produced in the jello factories just by the color of the water in the nearby river. So, little by little, the seeds of this paranoid idea took root in the town's mind. Seeds that germinated when the first of the girls began to suffer from those inexplicable ailments. And Beth Miller began to dig deeper, and in fact, she and several of her neighbors had suffered from tumors in the past, and she had heard of cancer cases on the street where she and her family had previously lived. So the idea that her daughter's symptoms were related to some pollutant in the environment never left her. Beth followed these leads until one day, someone left a series of documents under her doormat about a nearby railroad accident in Leroy. The disaster had occurred more than 40 years earlier in 1970, and the papers stated that the accident had spilled thousands of gallons of highly toxic chemicals, including a solvent linked to nervous system damage after high exposure. So three months after her daughter Katie fell ill, Beth contacted none other than Erin Bronkovich, the famous environmental activist and paralegal played by Julia Roberts in the movie of the same name. Bronkovich, perhaps more interested in the big story at hand than anything else, sent a team to Leroy to analyze the school grounds and determine if the school might have been built on soil transported from the contaminated site. Brockovich's team, accompanied by a CNN crew and other journalists, arrived in town on Saturday, January 28th, only to find local police waiting to prevent them from accessing the facilities. And this situation caused a bit of tension, as you can imagine, plunging the town further into a climate of anger and irrationality that even the newcomers could taste. Bob Bocock, one of the analysis on Brockovich's team, claim that the presence of the police, rather than serving as mere peacemakers to prevent disorder and irrationality, indicated that there was something to hide. 
A woman named Robbie Horn, mother of four, echoed the same sentiment, stating, I'm very angry. I mean, what are they trying to hide? Were they not allowed to take the little soil sample? In a local newspaper poll found that 67% of the 1,600 respondents did not trust the Leroy schools to look out for the best interest of the students. You've always got to get you a second opinion, man. Especially when you're living in them small towns where everybody, they got that good old boy system and everybody going to look out for everybody. Like, you got to get second, third, fourth, fifth opinions, man. We just had a, a chemical explosion here yesterday. And I'm keeping my eye on that thing. People had to be evacuated. Look it up. Rockdale County. Rockdale County. Big explosion on TV. Showed it. Now, I'm trying to see what's the after effects of that. People breathing that in. Could easily something like this happen. By this point, it had been five months since the first teenager had fallen ill. The quiet town of Leroy, the place people lived to get away from all the hustle bustle, had become a complete circus. What had started as a strange case of a group of teens suffering from unexplained ailments now escalated into a potential environmental crisis. And Kim Cox, the school's principal, offered the best assurances to the angry and irrational parents that proper analysis had been done and that no expert had found any evidence of anything that could cause the girls distress. But these words fell on deaf ears. By this time, Brockovich was making regular media appearances. She continued to speak out about her suspicions that there was some chemical component in the area and highlighted the low level of trust the townspeople had in the authorities. Unsubstantiated rumors of natural gas wells on school property and toxic waste dumps a few miles outside of town and an orange sticky substance oozing from playgrounds spread around. And so, it's no surprise that just as the patient seemed to begin to recover, their symptoms once again flared up. Laszlo Meckler, one of the many neurologists in Buffalo who had treated some of the girls, said, They were returned to the office completely terrified, sobbing, and saying things like, These chemicals are in my head, and I'm going to be damaged for life. When neurologists continued claiming that the tics, spasms, and seizures the girls were experiencing were due to a conversion disorder, most parents raised their fists in protest. The idea that their daughter's illnesses had a psychological cause didn't sit well with anyone, either parents, nor of course the girls. It's likely that the parents found it confusing to hear about deep stress when their daughters had been as normal as ever in the days before. By the time the New York Times interviewed them, both Katie and Thera were convinced that the epidemic of ticks and seizures sweeping the city couldn't be due to hysteria, with Katie stating in reference to the start of the sickness, Thera and I have definitely had moments of stress, but this was not one of those times. A quick investigation, however, would suggest otherwise. The second time Katie and her best friend were taken to the hospital, they were not accompanied by either of their parents. Instead, they were accompanied by the mother of Katie's boyfriend. And the reason? At the time, Katie's mother was recovering from a recent brain surgery. In addition to the brain tumor, Beth also suffered from trigeminal neuralgia, a nerve condition that causes severe facial pain. In the weeks leading up to her surgery, while she had been so ill that she could barely get out of bed, just a week before Katie's tics, she had undergone surgery, not for the second, third, or fourth time, but for the thirteenth. 
In reference to this, Katie said without a trace of emotion on her face that she was quite used to it and that it had been a walk in the park. Mera hadn't had it much easier. A few years ago, her family had suffered a loss they could only describe as traumatic. Though the family asked that the details be kept private, the situation had severely damaged the girl's relationship with her biological father. She had not had contact with him since she was young and recently felt so bad that she was having trouble sleeping after some harsh words they had exchanged. She even admitted that both she and her mother were very upset because her father was unwilling to travel from South Carolina to Leroy to visit her after her seizures began. And she said, I used to be sissy to him, a nickname he called her, and now I'm just Thera. And he used to be dad, and now he's just Frank. What was also interesting was that the ticks began to spread in an almost rigid way, as if following the strange social classes of high school. And they started with the much more popular girls like Katie and Thera, and affected young people of much lower status, if you will, after that. And there were even cases of teenagers pretending to have the same symptoms to get on the news. A situation, by the way, that is quite common when such cases occur because, well, a lot of people tend to follow the herd and don't want to be left out. Thus, using almost the same means as three centuries ago, hysteria spread throughout a small town affecting, directly or indirectly, depending on the case, hundreds of people. Not because of the malevolent- So if they were able to obtain this through stress and not some chemical or something that was in the air or in the soil, grass, whatever, why can't, so they can't go back to normal? They can't, like, you know what I mean? Figure out some way to get them back to normal. Calm them down. Like, any type of stress relief over the years, maybe not just happen overnight, but over the years, keep them stress-free, try to keep them stress-free. They can't get back to normal. That's what I'm just having a hard time dealing with. Like, you stress about something, and this is now with you for life? That's, that, bro, that's, that's hard. Levelant actions of the devil, or even a minor or major environmental crisis. But because of something much closer and more invisible, but just as powerful, the influence of our own minds.